The next moderator of the panel I'm so excited about. Um, we actually have something in common because my name is B. Arthur and I know y'all were expecting 90 sitcom star B. Arthur. <laughs> But I'm not her, right? I have a whole different life. The next speaker is actually named Kirsten Stewart, but she is not a vampire <laughs> who falls in love with a werewolf, no. She was born and raised right here in Toronto, and next week she starts a new position in Geneva at the World Economic Forum. So she's gonna be, I know, right? She's gonna be ho hosting a fantastic team that's gonna talk to us about the humanity and its role and responsibilities in the future of technology. So please welcome to the stage, and you check out everybody's bios on page 36 of your program. It's gonna be Julie. Fran Hauser, my boo, Jay, Jerry, and of course, Kirsten Stewart. <laughs> my boo. You are my Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So happy to be with you here today. Uh, and uh, I know this is the end of, or almost the end of a, of, of a long, fruitful and engaging day. I've been able to hear, I haven't been here in person, but I've been watching online. It's been amazing to see so many great people participating and talking about moving the dial together. Uh, I'm Kirsten Stewart, as B said, uh, and uh, I'm so grateful to be here with this amazing lineup of people to be talking about technology and its effect on humanity, or should we say humanity and its effect on technology. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we'd go through very quickly and introduce the panel each one by one. And Julie, if we could start with you. Sure, thank you, Kirsten. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Hansen, and I work at Salesforce. Um, I work here in the Canadian office, and I have a global role as a senior strategic advisor where I work with top executives with our customers to help them plan long-term growth and uh, long-term success with us. Hi, everyone. I'm Fran Hauser. I'm a startup investor. I have 20 companies in my portfolio, all consumer, mostly tech, um, and I'm really proud to say 18 of those companies are female-founded. And thank you, thank you. Um, I'm also the author of The Myth of the Nice Girl, which is all about how you can bring your whole self to work. Um, and that includes things like kindness, compassion, and empathy, um, and still be successful. Um, and the book, I think there's still some books left. If you haven't taken one, please do. And it's just such an honor to be here, thank you. My name is Jerry Rionga. I'm actually a founder and CEO of Upcountry Africa Fund Assets Corporation here in Toronto. We are domiciled also in the Cayman Islands. It's an African fund. We're very excited mm. about this African fund that happens to be launched out of Canada. And uh, we're passionate about basically seeing the change in, in the narrative of the African story, both internationally as well as on the continent. And I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm passionate about human beings. My name is Jay Rosenzweig, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm also very passionate about uh, helping to really affect uh, positive change and growth, whether it be helping business people scale up uh, their companies so that they can achieve their next levels of success, or advocating for gender uh, diversity and gender equality, or human rights in general. And a big component of that is, is people. Um, so really um, having a strong network, a diverse network, um, having a keen eye for talent, and really understanding um, who fits into whatever organization or cause at the right time and at the right place. And if, and if you have people at your core and, and relationships at your core, I feel that nothing's impossible. And I know, I, I know we've heard from you just now, but please, if you'd like to tell me a bit more about your background, it'd be lovely. I was going to say we agree, nothing is impossible. Uh, well, beside founding Women for Women International, I'm also the um, host of uh, and executive producer of um, Me Too, Now What? Uh, and uh, the author of a new release book, Freedom is an Inside Job. Yes, and you must look for that book. It's amazing. Thank you so much, uh, for all of you, for being with us here today. Uh, as I said off the top, you know, this is our opportunity to talk a bit about technology, humanity, equality. There's been so much discussed about that lately, and particularly around the idea of, um, particularly around the idea of uh, you know, technology. When you think about what's happening currently in, in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. as an example, you know, we have leaders of tech businesses who are currently restricting the amount of technology their own children are seeing, I guess out of fear of some kind of displacement or disconnection mm -hmm. with humanity. 
uh, you know, you can look at technology as a challenge. You can look at technology as an enabler. When you look at technology and humanity and the individual in particular, how do you feel that technology is actually affecting our connection to humanity? Fran, we talked a bit about this backstage, but maybe you yeah. can tell, tell people your story. Yeah, well, so I can just um, share an observation that I've had, especially recently, I would say over the last year, in the world of investing where I'm seeing so much more ghosting where investors are ghosting on founders. Um, and why is this tied to technology? Because when you meet someone online, um, you're most likely not going to bump into them face to face in the future. So it's just easier to disappear from their life. So I'm seeing a lot of founders, founders who, you know, I'm an, in, an investor in their businesses where they're fundraising and they meet a potential investor, you know, through a warm introduction over email. Um, and then they get into a little bit of due diligence, again, like over email, they do some phone calls. Um, the investor expresses a huge amount of interest and then they just disappear. And this is so frustrating for founders because for any founders that are in the audience, um, you guys know fundraising is such a distraction from actually running the business. So when you put that much time and energy into building a relationship with someone, um, and then they don't have the common courtesy or common decency of closing the loop with you. Um, so that's just one thing that I'm seeing. And it's, it's not just in investing. I'm kind of seeing it in different parts of my life, you know, even my personal life. So this idea of um, emotionally closing the loop yeah. with someone, I think is just really important. It's, it's not fair to just kind of leave them hanging. Yeah, and it's interesting because in my own experience, I was at one time at Twitter and I think there was this, you know, this idea that you know, the technology can make these wonderful connections, but they also make a kind of connection which has a bit of a veneer in front of it. And so how do you break through to those connections? Do you have an example, Julie, of something? I know that you talked a bit about some things that were happening more kind of marketplace-wise that kind of opened up the opportunities of technology and humanity. One that's uh, closely related to connecting online is, um, and just pivoting from what we had spoken of earlier, mm -hmm. is um, I've also seen where collaboration online and connecting online can be an amazing thing. Um, at Salesforce a number of years ago when we launched our more collaborative platform, we would run a conference every year. And that conference would have a lot of um, independent business women who were uh, developers and, and administrators, and they'd be showing up at our conference called Dreamforce by themselves. The year that we put a collaborative tool into the conference and to be utilized by our customers uh, was the moment something got born that started very small. Uh, like Jody said, one small little step can, can grow into something really big. Where online, this one woman, uh, her name is Geraldine Gray, uh, she was alone at the conference, and so she um, posted something out there and said, hey, if there are any other uh, women in tech here, um, come meet me for a drink. I'd love to hang out. We can go to some sessions together. And so the year she did that, four women showed up at a bar. They had a, a great time and went to these sessions together and bonded. The next year, they became roomies to save money on the, uh, on the hotels and met some more people. And the next year, it grew even more. So Geraldine became the founder of something called Girly Geeks, which is actually a huge um, women in tech coding organization that became something called Women in Tech. So now in the Salesforce uh, ecosystem, there are thousands of women around the world who connect, they share code, they support each other, they collaborate online, and it all started from one person reaching out and being completely supported by others who also want to be connected. So when you think about that connection and how it can literally go global, they're not the same challenges of barriers and, and geography as you, that those have been surpassed by technology. They give you this open kind of world and marketplace. You know, Jerry and, and Zaina, you're both involved very much on, in, in international movements. Do you, how do you use technology to connect with that community or expand the community, Jerry? Uh, yes, so for example, leaving here, I have activities that take place back in Kenya, where I'm from. And at the farm particularly, when I have actually people tilling the land or doing any sorts of handiwork based on the house that we are renting and so on, I actually use M-Pesa to actually pay them. Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to use uh, internet connectivity mm -hmm. and the different technologies that exist today mm -hmm. to pay someone their pay and their daily worth kip 
using my mobile phone, mm -hmm. sitting out of a Toronto office or Toronto, uh, my residence here in Toronto. So I think there's a lot that comes with the use of technology that's very, very powerful in my view. Mm -hmm. I've also seen the opportunity, for example, in 2009, um, I had just uh, downgraded and left, you know, running a company that I started, an internet company that I started, and I was now becoming a consultant in my space. And I also wanted to do global consultancy work, and I actually hired someone out of India to become a personal assistant who was going to be working at a different time zone. So somebody in India is actually doing some activity of work while I'm sitting in Nairobi doing a different activity of work. Mm -hmm. And now that I've moved here to Toronto, I have another uh, global perspective in terms of having different people working at different projects throughout the 24 hours that we have in terms of life cycle of work getting done. So I think the, uh, the element of technology has, in my opinion, been very, very powerful, especially in the beginning when I moved here. I'd had to wake up at 3, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning to do certain pieces of work, which I now don't have to do right, right. because I've you know, basically delegated those functions Amazing. successfully. And, and Zenob, in terms of what you've been doing? Well, I mean, all of, uh, all of that is, is correct. The benefits of technology my, my, uh, and, and, and all the opportunities it opens. My biggest concern right now is the, is the gap in access to technology. Mm -hmm. So I work with a lot of very, very, very poor and marginalized people from all over the world, particularly women from all over the world. And usually it's like the, the teenage son who has the phone, mm -hmm. you know, and so we have, or sometimes not, you know, and so on the one hand, you're increasing education access. There are now classrooms that are sharing mm -hmm. between different countries, classrooms to classrooms. So there's a lot of benefit, but we have to be very aware of the gap between those who don't and those who don't. It used to be only money, now it's technology as well. Mm -hmm. And my, my, it's not a, a way that cannot be resolved, it can. We just have to be very more attuned to that that there is a certain part of the population still significant in the world who still doesn't have access. Absolutely. And we've got to make that accessible. Those who do, though, it increased literacy, money, uh, uh, you know, jobs, mm -hmm. all of it. So there is a lot of good, but let's be aware of the things that could be it's happening. A real, it's a real currency. And when you, Jay, you know, you're involved in a lot of VC mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. partnerships, like, do you see there a good possibility for partnerships between private and public or in, in, in order to actually enable technology? Well, there's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, but what's most interesting to me is actually the social aspect and the, the human rights aspect, mm -hmm. as uh, Zainab talked about, and, and particularly access, although I've been reading more and more that access is becoming better, uh, including in places like India, uh, which is really important as mobile becomes uh, less and less expensive, and the access becomes less and less expensive. Um, I learned early on uh, in law school from, uh, from a mentor of mine, uh, uh, a professor named Erwin Kotler, who uh, uh, is an international human rights champion and, and represented uh, pl political prisoners like Nelson Mandela and Natan Sharansky, that the mobilization of shame mm -hmm. uh, against governments can be a very, very powerful tool. Um, and all the more so today with, with the technologies we all have. Um, uh, we're, uh, I'm on his board right now, a uh, human rights board called the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and we're representing the Nelson Mandela's of today all around the world in places like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and Iran and China, and um, uh, we just did a Twitter storm on Friday um, uh, showing support for a, a client of ours Raif Badawi in, in, in Saudi Arabia. So it can be a really, really powerful tool. I'm also um, uh, part of a program called Spark um, around a, a business I'm involved in in, in in Venice Beach in California. It's uh, a company called Winston House, uh, which is a beautiful place for creatives. Uh, and we're fortunate to have a lot of influencers around the Winston House. Um, so the idea is to spark uh, the youth spark uh, concepts that are important uh, that we feel that the youth should be galvanized on and, 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 and have um, influencers with at least one million followers on, on Instagram posting and, and, and live streaming um, and, and hashtagging the, the very same thing at the very same time. So, for example, the, uh, the night before uh, the March for Our Lives, after that uh, terrible atrocity happened mm -hmm. in, in Florida, we, we were sort of the digital campaign galvanizing the youth to show up the next day. And I think at least 2 million 
young people ended up marching uh, in Washington and sister cities all around the world. Um, so I think, I think technology can really be used for good. Yeah, and that real kind of public-private partnership mm -hmm. as well, you know, enabling and get, making sure there's access mm -hmm. and new technologies. And yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, something else that was in the news just recently was the, the, the um, what happened at Amazon. We talk about the technology moving so quickly, and AI is obviously one of those you know, factors that is something that's dominating more and more of our lives in technology. Uh, and you know, Amazon was in particular using a, an algorithmic AI uh, learning tool which they would use in order to source for talent. Uh, they did a, an audit on this and realized that because AI is based on all of the information that's come before it, it actually reinforces, unfortunately, a lot of those biases that came before it. So it's a, it's a summation of history. History isn't always right, and so it's informing future decisions, that, and that might not be the best outcome. So Amazon very smartly kind of dropped this in order to make sure that they were accessing the most diversity possible. You know, when you think about things like that and all these new technologies being developed, you know, what is the role that we make? How do we ensure that women have their proper place in this? How do we make sure that as technology develops, it does include perspectives of all people uh, and so that there is the right kind of reflection of different perspectives as, as the technology is born? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd like to sort of give an example of uh, what's happening with accelerators that are actually uh, installed within the university uh, campuses where there is uh, a good body of, of, of different types of humans, if you like. Mm -hmm. And if we can actually start to embody this, not just within country, but also to have an international connection, a connectedness of sorts that brings people to the table to have this conversation, particularly in the space of machine learning and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, because perspective is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the nuances of each um, grouping of people is, is, is very different from one group to the next. Yeah. And even when you live in, in a place like Canada, where we have diversity in, in its true sense, you know, you would imagine that we would not be having this conversation if we actually were having the, tr the real conversations, but we're not. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think I would, I would really uh, look to some of the um, activities that are taking place. For example, in Kenya, we had a thousand um, uh, people in an accelerator within a university that were actually focusing on actually de developing capacity on coding and, and, and engineering types of activities that relate to uh, changing the way peop the youth get employed. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a function of bringing more, uh, more jobs so, so, yeah, mm -hmm. into, into... Julie, you just said you were just came back from India, um, where I think you probably had some experiences there in doing something similar. Can you maybe tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so um, one of the things that Salesforce is, is great for and why I've worked there for almost 12 years is the fact that there's flexibility given to us in how we choose to give back and spend our time volunteering um, so I just returned Monday night from being over in India working with a number of um, global leaders but also being very much on the ground um, in Africa related to uh, the protection of children, especially vulnerable girls and human trafficking. Um, it was a very tough thing to go through to see and um, my brain automatically when I was working with them and talking with the leaders was thinking, okay, you know, how can I help you with technology? Like, where can I stick this in here to make your world better? And it was clear, a couple things were really clear, and one was that they didn't need it just yet, that when it comes to technologies like 3D printing and AI and things like that, we all want to understand them, and, and businesses want to jump on the technologies to get a competitive advantage. But that's where the human piece has to come into play first. I asked one of this, the women leaders who, she takes care of a night nursery. Uh, we were right in the middle of the red light district of Mumbai. And um, in talking with her, I said, like, what has been a failure for you? <coughs> this looks like a really great system so far. You, these children come in at night, they stay over, they go to school the next day. They're all accounted for, they all have a number. And it's all done in files right now. But she said, you know, I failed first because I, the, the woman running this, she, she's also from trafficking. Um, she's a survivor. She said, I thought I knew it all, and so I put a program in place um, that I thought would be helpful, and I realized in some cases I had to pivot and shift, and the way I knew to do that was to be very involved with the children, with the teens when they came in, to really understand and connect them one-on-one. -on -one. And so 
bringing in a technology like like AI or being able to track the children better so that none of them go missing, that type of thing um, is something that I see happening. But long before that, uh, the bigger lesson is to really know who you're trying to serve and what they need and then fill technology in as, as needed. Um, and then to be careful for the biases that'll be in that data. Uh, AI needs a lot of data, um, but you need to check and, and go with your gut instinct on things as well to truly understand what the best fit is for someone. That's a great real life example. And when I think about women in technology and awareness of women and what they do and how they can impact technology, um, and Fran, you know, you're, you invest in, in a lot of am amazing women-led businesses. Um, you know, Jay, you very much are working on human capital and how to bring women to the forefront and being involved in places like this, like Move the Dial. Uh, Zainab, we talked a bit about how in Dubai, I think it is, you're bringing some young women over because there's a certain perception in the Middle East. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about that. Well, I want to, uh, before that, I, I would say we need, they're still, we're still missing, women are still missing from yep. the design process yep. and from our voice process. So it doesn't matter if you're a social, with, with an enterprise with social venture or with designing. I mean, if you look at gaming and all of these things, there's a saying that says, we see things as we are, we do not see things as they are. So if your team are only men, it's just they're going to see it as mm -hmm. they are. And mm -hmm. we've got to include more women in every, across all, all the layers, mm -hmm. you know, in order to make sure that we are reflecting the society accurately. So I'll stop here, mm -hmm. you know, and in, the, in, th in terms of Dubai, it is like, you know, if you're a fashionista, you can get, become very popular. If you're someone with a cause and you want to have some more substantial conversation, there's not much energy for us. So we really need to get together. We're putting together a group of people to powwow on how do we actually echo and increase the voices of women who have more substance than, not that fashion, there's anything wrong with it. I obviously like it, but you know, uh, but more, you yeah. know, yeah. with more. Yeah, with more. And I think, you know, and th thank you so much. It was great to hear from the panelists here to talk a bit about, you know, how, how humans and technology really, you know, they, they are diverging and how we can make sure that we still within the technology find the humanity and we find the opportunities to increase humanity because really technology should be an enabler in this. And the perspectives of women and people of different color and different backgrounds is gonna be so important as we develop all these new technologies. And it was great in the short time that we had together this afternoon to talk about these things. And I just wanna please give a thanks to our panel here today. Thank you. Kirsten Stewart, there she goes, thank you, thank you. You're still my boo. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. That was really fantastic.